Thank you for joining us for our presentation today on polymer fibrosis and how it intersects with access to palliative care. Uh, today, we have two great presenters. Uh, first, we have Dr. Doris Barwick. And uh, Dr. Barwick is a palliative care physician, researcher, and leader of the medical director for the BC Center for Palliative Care. She has served on a number of committees working to improve access to palliative care for all Canadians affected by a serious illness. And our second presenter today is Dr. Shalini Nair. And Dr. Nair is currently working at the Surrey Memorial Hospital and Fraser Health, as well as the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, she is currently the local department head of the Surrey Acute um, Palliative Care Program and she's working as a respirologist and palliative care medical doctor. Thank you both ladies for coming on today. And if I can ask Dr. Barwich to start the presentation with her slides. Okay, just trying to share my screen here. Just waiting till my screen comes up. It says I'm screen sharing, but I'm not seeing it. We can see your presentation. You can? All right, good. All right, thank you very much for asking us to come and speak to you today about a topic I think that's very close to both of our hearts. So I've been asked to speak to you just very briefly before uh, we uh, hear from Dr. Nair about just hospice palliative care in Canada. Um, we understood that some of the questions were about um, what is palliative care and how do I access it? How do I um, maybe understand when to access it for myself or for a family member? And just some of those sorts of questions. And so I'm speaking today on behalf of the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association, uh, Dr. Laurel Gillespie, the new CEO. And I myself am the medical director for the BC Center for Palliative Care, an organization that's trying to improve access to palliative care across many, many domains. So the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association, just briefly, is the national voice for hospice palliative care in Canada. And their goal really is, what I've said, that all Canadians would have access to quality uh, care, hospice palliative care, and that they're the leader in pursuit of that through various, various different avenues. Um, they coordinate a group called the Quality End of Life Coalition, and I'm not sure if your organization is part of that or not, but many, many associations such as Alzheimer's Society, Cancer Society, a Lung Association, Kidney Foundation, etc., are members of this coalition, which in Times like now where we have an election coming, they speak with one voice about issues uh, related to improving end of life care for all Canadians. Um, care that allows them to die with dignity, free of pain, surrounded by loved ones in the setting of their choice. And so um, they have been the major voice for palliative care and improving access over many years. And in fact, have been quite successful in that in that now there is um, been an investment in palliative care, eleven billion dollars from the national from the federal government over a ten year time frame that started in 2017 with sort of two priority areas. One is home and community care, which includes palliative care, and then mental health and addiction to facilitate how we should be spending that money and what it should be directed towards. The National Palliative Care Framework was released and approved by government in 2018. And then a year later, a five-year action plan was published that really detailed what are the actions, what are the things we need to do to really uh, make palliative care more accessible, more available, more people really understanding what it is and what it can offer to people. And so the, the three main goals are related to awareness, both of palliative care and advanced care planning. And um, uh, Dr. Nair will touch on that a little bit in her presentation to support a better quality of care. Sometimes we have access, but the care isn't quite what it should be. And so there's a huge emphasis on educating um, um, care providers and others. Um, sessions like this one, which where we talk about palliative care and we talk more about the details in relation to a specific disease, um, because we know that it grew up really in relation to cancer, but that lots of people, increasingly more and more people are not dying of cancer, but of heart disease, lung diseases, and other diseases that affect um, how they 
um, how they end their lives. And also the fact that sometimes if you're from a, a different culture or ethnicity, sometimes that care isn't quite developed in the way that your, um, your culture understands it or would like to receive it. So improving access to culturally sensitive palliative care is another one of the five main aims of this uh, strategy. So what is hospice palliative care? And because the uh, Hospice Palliative Care Association came together with professionals who largely talk about palliative care, um, and uh, volunteer organizations that were providing community-based supports, we have both words, hospice, palliative care, both uh, signifying slightly different focuses of care, but all together, uh, we are trying to improve this care across the spectrum and across a variety of settings. So palliative care is a specialized form of healthcare for individuals and families who are living with a life-limiting illness that is usually at an advanced stage. So this awareness that there are unique issues um, for people as they are approaching the last chapter of their lives. And the goal is to provide comfort, quality of life and dignity for the person who's living with the illness as well as their family and caregivers. And that's what makes palliative care a little bit unique. Most of medicine is organized around diseases you know, respiratory diseases, cardiac diseases, kidney diseases, but we focus on the person and their, and their sort of family as they define it and try to make sure that that unit of care is cared for throughout their journey and then even after that person dies with bereavement services. It includes pain management, symptom management, and it includes all the other issues that someone may be facing at end of life, be they social, um, be they psychological, emotional, or spiritual. We recognize that we are whole beings um, and that the needs that we have at this time of life may be your, uh, existential questions that we need to talk with someone, or they may be a lack of support that allows us to be as independent as we want to be as long as possible. And for many diseases that are chronic, long-term, we realize that the, the best thing we can do is to support caregivers because they bear the burden of disease together with the person who has the illness. And so this idea of kind of providing um, a circle of support, a safety net that, that says, we will um, help you live as well as you can for as long as you can. It's not about death, it's not about dying, it's not about end of life, but it's about living well and really looking at the whole picture of what that means for that individual. So we know that about 60 to 90% of those who die could benefit fit from some additional supports, as I've just described it. Um, there's only about 3% of us who die suddenly in our sleep or unexpectedly. For the rest of us, it will be a disease that we know about, that we're familiar with, that will um, eventually cause uh, our death. And we do know that the public is overwhelmingly in support of palliative care and improving the quality of that care. We do know, however, that still only 15% of Canadians have early access to palliative care. Over 60% of referrals um, to palliative care come in the last month of life. And that's almost too late to really help you live as well as you can for as long as you can, because by that time, we're really just dealing with end of life issues, but that's not the philosophy of palliative care. So palliative care uh, should be provided whenever there are symptoms or pain or other issues that are interfering with the quality of your life. We also know that when palliative care is provided, that often um, it, it, uh, it's, it's too late to really make a difference and that lots of the care therefore then is an emergency on a crisis basis or um, and not really able to answer all the issues that are arising. So we do know from the literature that when you receive palliative care, which is often just this additional support that your primary care provider, your family doctor, your specialist are providing, that often we see improvements in pain and symptom management. People feel more supported, partly because what we do as palliative care providers is we often provide a bit of a roadmap. We'll say, here's where you are. 
here maybe are some of the issues that may come down the line for you. And we need to think all we need to start thinking about what we're going to do when you get to this stage or that stage to identify when your goals of care may change and, and to con continue to stay relevant to your goals of care, to the individual's goals of care throughout the journey. We also know that when you have that circle of support around you, especially in the community where 90% of the care happens, that you don't need to go to emergency to get a refill for your pain medication or your other medication. You don't need to go uh, to, a, um, to see someone um, and, uh, because the care is provided where you are living um, and, and according to your needs. We also know that a lot of family members feel much more supported if this additional layer of support is put into place. And that we know that most people would prefer to die at home, but we know that many, many people right now do not have the access to the level of care or support that they might need, but that those who do receive that support are more likely to die at home than those who didn't receive that support. So although about 60% of people who die in Canada receive uh, some kind of palliative care supports, uh, is the 15% applies to those who access specialized palliative care services. Sometimes confusing because those numbers uh, kind of represent the range of what's available. We also know that specifically for lung diseases and specifically for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a bit of the topic for us today, that a task force for lung health identified that people with lung diseases often face as much or more pain and other issues than cancer patients. That shortness of breath is a particularly distressing symptoms uh, for both the person suffering from shortness of breath and their family members who often feel a high level of distress and helplessness. And that this has a huge impact on the quality of your life. And that in the last year of life, what people were telling this task force was that what their priorities were is to understand their disease and its progression the kind of symptoms they may be facing and to have a plan in place to manage those and to really be asked questions about what does quality of life look like for you? What are your goals? What matters most? Those kinds of questions help them understand how to navigate uh, the different seasons in association with their illness. So again, palliative care uh, goal is to support the person experiencing the symptoms and their caregivers. And then advanced care planning is an important component, particularly for chronic illnesses, where uh, over the course of several years, your goals may change. And we need to stay uh, up to date with those goals as they're changing. There needs to be an action plan for a crisis. What happens when we get into trouble? Uh, in many, many provinces now, I believe in every province, there are initiatives to train paramedics on providing basic palliative care at home. So that when you reach that crisis, and even if you need to call 911, those paramedics know what to do to support you in the midst of a crisis. And that that can really help reduce stress and anxiety when there is this net safety net or circle of support in place. And that we know that that often for lung, for lung diseases and particularly in pulmonary fibrosis needs to be provided earlier not just at end of life, but that earlier integration of the circle of support improves quality of life and the care you receive throughout your entire trajectory. So more information about palliative care is available at these places for the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. And as I said, um, access issues are often provincial in nature or could even be regional in nature. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about that. Um, but I also wanna leave enough time for my colleague, Dr. Nyer to speak more specifically uh, to the issues associated. Dr. Nyer is both a respirologist and a palliative care physician. She's a, a colleague of mine in Fraser Health and, um, and it's such an honor to be able to present with her today. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Nair? Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen to bring my slides up. Um, um, so can anybody see my presentation? We can see them. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Oh, 
Okay, so um, uh, thank you, Dr. Barwick and Sharon. So as um, Dr. Barwick, Barwick was discussing, you know, palliative medicine um, and interstitial lung disease is a very particular niche because every sort of disease, of course, does have its own constellation. Of Dr. Symptoms. Meyer, yeah? can I ask you to speak closer to the um, oh. phone? It's hard is for it better? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so each, each constellation of lung disease does have its own sort of symptom management need. And so what I'm hoping to do is to look at the role of palliative medicine in interstitial lung disease, specifically pulmonary fibrosis in and of itself. We can review disease trajectory and look at some of the evidence we've been able to garner by, by patient-related factors, as well as some treatment options and indications that people might have throughout the course of their illness. So as Dr. Barwick mentioned, we're looking at quality of life factors. That's what we're really talking about when we're talking about palliative care. Yes, we are including end of life care because that is a natural progression for everyone. But we have noted that early identification is probably the most important factor in patients who have pulmonary fibrosis and, and other forms of interstitial lung disease. The reason for that is the symptom burden sort of creeps up on all of us. And so We'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. But your palliative medicine doctor, um, even if not trained in respirology, um, should be able to do a pretty thorough overall medical examination to be very sure that the, we're treating the actual symptoms related to suffering and reviewing any other reversible causes of that suffering that could be treated in a different way. Previously, you know, and this is this may be still how some people view palliative medicine, we did look at it as kind of a, a line in the sand. Either you have a disease modifying approach like a cure or treatment to extend life, or you have a palliative approach, right? Um, these things have now evolved to this bow tie model that has been developed by one of our colleagues in British Columbia as well and our UBC division head, where we look at palliative medicine as mainly an intersection between disease management and pain and symptom management. And the only difference is that at various aspects of the illness, do you need more pain and symptom management or less? And of course, it always, when it relates to cancer as well, needs to include rehabilitation and survivorship. This is my bow tie model. Different clinical courses, you know, um, you may hear of people who have a cancer and palliative medicine as it relates to cancer-related illness or palliative medicine as it relates to old age or organ failure. And, you know, really these disease trajectories are different and we should identify them as such because we have in cancer-related illnesses, for example, very clear and evidence factors that tell us we can measure things in these patients, for example, tumor size, functional capacity, and we know that they, they are, it's hard for people to recover from that. And that may be the beginning of a decline towards the end of their life. In an organ system trajectory, the one that I think is more indicative of you know, where pulmonary fibrosis would sit, the disease is characterized by a diagnosis that's kind of late in life, but is characterized by a series of exacerbations and remissions, you actually may get sick and get better, get sick and get better, get sick and get better. So that, that really doesn't give us much information about somebody's length of life. And so when we talk about length of life in patients who have pulmonary fibrosis, you will hear us say, well, I don't have a crystal ball. And, and we kind of don't, but what we all need to be aware of is what we do know is that as people continue on over time, having an, any long-term illness that involves an organ, eventually reserve starts to go down. So you may notice that the multiple exacerbations of the underlying disease, maybe there's a hospitalization, maybe there's a pneumonia, never are able to quite get back to that same high function or higher function that was there prior. So it is a stepwise process, but 
what we don't know is the, the length of time between exacerbations. And so that's why you also hear us lung doctors talk about all of the preventative things you can do to prevent this exacerbation. It takes a toll on your body. And so the prognosis is a little uncertain. So the best thing to do when we have an illness that has an uncertain prognosis is to be prepared early. The worst that could happen is we talked about everything, we did our advanced care planning, we know about your goals of care, but we don't really have to use them for a long time. And you don't have to have that conversation for a while unless your views have changed. So we know in patients who have cancer, people talk about palliative medicine a lot, and they should, and it's very valuable, and it, this does not take away from that. However, it's less integrated in chronic medical disease of which pulmonary fibrosis is a part of. When we look at the evidence we have in patients that have cancer-related illnesses, we know that there are benefits in pain, that their advanced care planning gets done early, that the social stresses relating to both the family and the patient show benefit, and in at least one study, they lived a little longer. So who would benefit from this palliative approach in patients who maybe do not have a cancer diagnosis? My, my thoughts would be for patients to have a voice. So if people said, hey, I want to talk about it, I need the supportive care, that's obviously a flag for all of us to learn from. So if you're wondering yourself, you know, is this something that I should be pursuing either in the context of a medical professional or a person with the illness, would you be surprised if your lifespan were shortened to about a year? If you're feeling inside or the medical professional's feeling inside is maybe not, I wouldn't be surprised, then maybe introducing a conversation is the right time. As we looked at the organ trajectory, the more events you have which, which put you in hospital indicate that the disease may be less controlled than maybe after X number of visits to hospital, you could say, listen, you know, you've had three events in the last six months, we need to be talking about this. And then there's disease specific indicators that we'll talk about. General indicators are people getting more frail in visiting hospital and people who are unable to fully care for themselves in their regular activities of daily living or significant changes to appetite or weight. That. Indicators that are pulmonary fibrosis specific have been looked at. These are not the end all be all indicators in IPF, but they are things for us to think about and things that have been either reported by patients or their families, which makes it honestly the best evidence in palliative medicine. So when we look for disease progression, we're looking at people who have increasing symptoms of difficulty controlling their shortness of breath. We're looking at measurable things like a decline on your pulmonary function test. We're looking at increased scarring on CT scan or increased acute events, things that happen very quickly, kind of out of nowhere, at increased frequency. If, if there isn't any other identifiable cause, progressive disease, which we're calling um, disease progression, would be objective assessment of increasing breathlessness, decreasing in several baseline numbers on pulmonary function tests. And now, if, if you're a patient that's joining us and you're looking at your breathing test, we're looking at the letters FVC, which is functional vital capacity, and DLCO, which is the diffusion capacity of oxygen across the membranes of your lungs. And we're looking at the CT scan, which can show us a, a veritable picture of whether or not things are progressing. So baseline factors that we are looking at that have been studied that we know are associated are listed here. So how breathless are you? Do you have a low diffusion capacity, which we would ca characterize as severe on your breathing test? And do your oxygen levels drop significantly when you're walking, when we make you do that walking test and the extent of scarring. There is also the condition of high blood pressure of the lungs we call pulmonary hypertension. And if you have the presence of pulmonary hypertension, 
that indicates a higher level of advanced disease. And over time, what, what I'm listing here as longitudinal factors, that's what you're looking at numbers-wise on your pulmonary function test and what us physicians need to be looking at and relying on to try and make decisions about when we would indicate that you were having progressive disease. So basically a change by 10 or 15% drop in either of the values we mentioned earlier. So we've looked at palliative medicine in various lung illnesses. COPD, which you may have heard of emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, has the highest level of study. Non-small cell lung cancer is also included, but the next biggest group is pulmonary fibrosis. And as Dr. Barwick alluded to, in some instances, when we do studies of quality of life in patients that have very advanced disease, we notice that overall quality of life, psychosocial stressors like depression, anxiety, as well as occasional pain or breathlessness are all worse. In the one particular study Dr. Barwick was alluding to, quality of life was actually lower than that in patients with lung cancer. And I know that we as a society do view lung cancer as a very, very serious illness. Um, and they do struggle significantly psychologically. So that degree of struggle is also present in pulmonary fibrosis. But that's a unique portion is that hospitalization is very common in patients with, with pulmonary fibrosis and also maybe usually unnecessarily prolonged. Thankfully, we do have bodies, um, European and American societies, as well as the Canadian Thoracic Society, that do view palliative medicine, obviously, as an important inclusion in respiratory medicine. And this has been looked at increasingly over the last decade. A lot of the studies that are done are in the United Kingdom. And we do in palliative medicine studies that are mainly qualitative. Some of them are quantitative, meaning we look at how drugs work, et cetera. But the qualitative studies where we actually ask people in interviews, either caregivers or patients, what issues they're experiencing are often our most important studies. So in one very large qualitative study interviewing patients who have pulmonary fibrosis and caregivers, they wanted to identify where, where the line is where specialist palliative medicine could be helpful. Patients expressed frustration at the loss of independence, which is completely, obviously um, understandable. They complained of uncontrolled symptoms of breathlessness. Interestingly, difficulty with sleep, uncontrolled cough, and worrying about their families as they dealt with the years go by with this illness. Caregiver concerns also included fam familial strain, but also expressed their helplessness and understanding how they could actually be helpful to their loved ones, and also how their trajectory, meaning what can they expect as a patient's life continues. Um, and they felt that they weren't informed very much about that. And then of course, our concern from a healthcare professional uh, perspective is our own feelings and lack of confidence in understanding how to manage these symptoms, as well as underestimating the psychological needs that our patients actually have with this type of illness. So we can we can provide as a team in palliative medicine a lot of a lot of care at home. You know, if things are not going well, if you notice some of those trajectory issues uh, coming up in, in your patient's care or in your care, the home care team is incredibly helpful, even just by starting with phone support. Um, and every community, you know, in British Columbia, we have the BC Palliative Benefits Program, and each health authority has its own community team that will deal with palliative medicine. So that, that referral form is different, but similar structures exist all over the country, which can help with as little or as more support as you would require. The team consists of specialists in uh, clinical nurse specialists, we have a social worker, spiritual care, and of course, physicians that would like to participate. And things that are discussed include having home support workers, talking about medication tips, talking about how we give medications to you, administer them while you're unwell, and talking about how we use oxygen, suction, and hospital beds. Um, and the frequency of nursing visits is really determined by need. You may not need all that much. And I'm mindful that you know when you're dealing or struggling with an illness or have a patient that's struggling with an illness that's long-term, 
having as much privacy and autonomy as you can is, is super important. And so you may, may not wish to have that degree of intervention introduced early. However, knowing that it's available when and if needed, um, you just gotta be aware of that. The second step is looking at the burden of symptoms. So that the patient described that they did feel breathless, but looking at actually all comers um, as the disease progressed, you know, what happens to them? And so the median ages I feel of this study were representative of our patient populations, age of 61 and 82 with different backgrounds. Towards the end of life, mainly people had increasing symptoms of breathlessness. Um, other things include cough, fatigue, depression, and chest pain. Um, chest pain is variable in people that have pulmonary fibrosis, but interestingly seems to be a hallmark of one of the symptoms that you could look out for. Um, I think a lot of people who have underlying lung disease do not feel that pain could be something they can complain about or that is related to their lung disease. And I would encourage you if you're experiencing that or if you have a patient experiencing that, that you explore whether or not that's true. Um, there is a high association of things like chest pain with all lung diseases. Looking at what the patients received, 22 out of the 45 patients, which is less than half, were trialed on pain medications, which I will describe to you as a treatment. 100% of those patients felt better. Eight of them had tranquilizer type or sedative type medications added for anxiety. All of them felt benefit. We do have some non-medicine strategies like home occupational therapy, et cetera, which I will describe to you that are also available to your home care team. Um, but they were rarely used in the patients that were looked at, and only 17 of those patients had access to palliative care specialists. So those numbers, you know, as I look at them, um, are why Dr. Barwick and I are here today doing our presentations. It's abysmal. It's low. It should be higher. It should be incorporated as thought, not an afterthought, and, and patients really do deserve better. Um, the numbers it's here in the numbers that, that the job isn't completely being done as well as we would like. Sometimes when home care isn't enough for a patient, right, they have a lot of symptoms and you can have a palliative medicine specialist they're admitted to hospital. There are palliative care physicians and a palliative care unit in, in most tertiary, tertiary level centers. Regions that you can be transferred to a, a palliative care unit exist, however, the scope of palliative care in a hospital will involve specialists that can at least be consulted on the phone or in person. If you are asked to go to a palliative care unit or have a patient admitted to a palliative care unit, what we're looking at is a full care unit, okay? Hospice and an acute care hospital unit are separate. Hospice will be discussed uh, just a little bit further but an acute palliative care unit is just another medical ward with the ability to have specialists involved in the care that may be titrating medications directly to your symptoms. Consultations are available by all other disciplines, including lung doctors or respirology, okay? And, and sometimes, you know, if things are changing and a person is approaching the end of their life with very difficult symptoms to manage, for example, very difficult to manage breathlessness, we actually are able to use infusional medications through the intravenous to help people keep comfortable, okay? So the option for introducing higher levels of palliative medicine should be endless if accessed appropriately. There are challenges to integrating this type of care. There will be challenges to integrating changing goals of care or needs or recognition of change in the trajectory of a patient. People themselves, from, from what we can gather, are, are generally very aware of the state of their illness and um, will be willing to discuss uh, majorly both prognosis and quality of life, especially if that is poor. Often, I feel like people, um, patients who are suffering with this illness are waiting for us as healthcare professionals to introduce the right time when it's relevant. And so sometimes that discussion just doesn't happen in a timely manner. And so I just, you know, to empower people who have this illness, I would encourage you to bring that up in case it's our discomfort that prevents us from having that conversation. Caregivers, 
you know, bless their hearts and souls. Um, they, they are often inaccurate about a patient's quality of life, you know, and study after study. And I, and I don't think it's because they don't know their loved one. That's, that's definitely not it. Um, I think that they're often protected from the degree of suffering that many patients may be feeling. And that's a hard thing for suffering patients to communicate. Generally, um, the caregivers or the public, um, it's hard to let go of the notion of doing something. So if you are noticing that either your patient or yourself is changing and you're really tired and you really don't want to continue some very, very aggressive treatment uh, that may not be useful, um, doing something does include advanced care planning and deciding when too much is too much. The belief that the option to do nothing is going to lead to more discomfort is common. Palliative medicine um, and comfort-related care in some instances as you want to call it, comfort care, are not doing nothing. Um, they're treating your illness in a different way, and it's being led by the direction your illness is going in. And so all it is is really changing the treatment options at that time. So it isn't really doing nothing. You won't be left on your own to flail and suffer. There are people here that are wanting and willing to help, and again, that is that is the purpose of the scene here today, okay? I want to be mindful when we talk about views of challenges in the general public that, of course, some religious and cultural beliefs do not integrate uh, palliative medicine easily, and that's okay, too. Um, and in the WHO definition of palliative medicine, and I think that you'll find in most palliative care doctors, those are things we, we obviously respect greatly and, and would continue to respect. And then there's the, the healthcare team, and, and I feel like we're kind of the hardest one because we like to have unrealistic expectations of success sometimes, and we err on the side of, of, of obviously hoping with everybody. It, it is, you know, when you, when you pull healthcare workers, it's just uncomfortable to see somebody transition to increasing weakness or advanced disease. And so a lot of times, some of us are the ones that are not, not talking about it. Um, that combined sometimes with a very good intentioned person who may have a lack of awareness of what options actually exist for palliative medicine, what, what um, services are available in your community, um, the fact that palliative care specialists are very aware of um, non-malignant diseases, so diseases which are not cancer, and maybe their lack of experience or discomfort in breaking bad news. Part of that, I think, is helped with the education that myself and my colleagues will do with each other, right? We do, we do talk about things like this with our colleagues in various disciplines, but also empowering people who are suffering from illnesses to be aware of the levels of education that they could get to, uh, with their illness and aware of the system um, themselves, right? So, so even being here for this type of conversation um, and you being aware is incredibly important. Sometimes you get a person whose disease is moving a lot faster, and then that's a particular challenge. And that challenge begins with a person who has unidentified um, to the healthcare community, but increasing symptom burden in their home, and then have, have an illness too quick to be assessed by an outpatient respirologist or GP. And so they must go to the emergency department for admission. And when they get admitted, they get better, and, and it's a hospital, right? So patients go to hospital, they get better, they leave, discharged home without longer-term care address, um, and then and back to increasing symptom burden. And so I guess you can see in that, you know, how many falls would have to get dropped to end up at no conversation. So then what we would argue to help break this cycle is that all patients that have an illness anything identifiable to have a conversation about their advanced care planning wishes and goals so that if this were to happen, those things would be identified early. That's part of early integration of advanced care planning, okay? Looking at chronic shortness of breath is a different story. So what we, what we would do in respiratory medicine is make sure that all therapies that you're using, and they may include a combination of nebulizers, they may include having an action plan at home with steroids and antibiotics, they may include who to call at what time, that those therapies are always optimized, okay? 
Then we have what we are calling the non-pharmacologic strategies, excuse me, and they are the ones that don't involve medicine. The ones that are specific for interstitial lung disease do include home supports early, so a home occupational therapy assessment, grab bars, sitting in the shower, anything to conserve energy. We do know that patients with any lung disease do prefer cooler temperatures to warmer temperatures, so even being mindful of fluctuations if, if you're privileged to be able to control the temperature in your surroundings. But also pulmonary rehabilitation. I know a lot of patients are hesitant to join pulmonary rehabilitation. Sometimes they think it's exhausting. They don't want to talk about it. Um, however, there are a lot of strategies introduced in pulmonary rehabilitation, which are not just exercise. And the benefits actually do include improvement in walk distance, improvement in breathlessness, improved education about all of the things we were talking about earlier, as well as a reduction in hospitalization. So, so pretty important to offer. And then you may hear if, if you've employed all of the above, maybe either a specialist palliative care doctor or a doctor that feels comfortable employing palliative care medication in your care, talk about management strategies with medications. Some of the medications that I am going to bring up here so that you've heard them before so that everybody knows what's available are what we're calling benzodiazepines or sedatives slash tranquilizer type medications specifically targeted for the symptom of anxiety, painkillers like morphine, a drug called methotrimethrazine, anything with a Z in it is super hard to remember, um, not specific to interstitial lung disease and a very off-label use but also the, ident the identification of anxiety and depression and the identification of end-of-life care, something that everybody will need at some, at some point. When your doctor or when us physicians speak about what we're calling opiates or painkillers and interstitial lung disease, we are drawing from an incredibly large body of evidence that tells us that using these medications at low and judicious doses, not high doses with increased frequency, um, can help by offsetting your breathlessness. I have treated over the last decade, many, many patients this way. People worry about opiate addiction or dependency. When we look at longer term studies, our rate of addiction or dependency, especially in patients that have no history of this prior, are incredibly low. We also need to trust that the physicians that are prescribing these medicines, part of our duty is regular checkups and to observe you for that. If we see, if we feel that a person is developing a dependency or addiction problem, it's part of our job to identify that. So there's some trust that goes into starting these medications. There have been several safety study use in these medications and some people may believe that they cause worsening breathing. There is, there's no clinical evidence that that actually happens, okay? It's a worry, but there, there actually is no significant um, lung side effects to a trial of a low and judicious dose of these medications, okay? Pain is the second major reason sometimes we use painkillers, obviously, in lung disease. We have had uh, several studies look at the correlation between pain and lung disease. Patients with COPD, for instance, describe an equal prevalence of pain symptoms as even patients who have lung cancer. And it may be that patients with similar illnesses like interstitial lung disease do have muscle fatigue from the amount that you're breathing, do have rib fractures from coughing or osteoporosis from the amount of steroids, or have long-term sequelae of infections of the chest that have occurred multiply. In one large study, COPD patients with interstitial lung disease patients are significantly less likely to be given strong painkillers for symptom control compared to lung cancer patients, despite having similar occurrences of pain. So validation of the presence of pain in lung disease is also important. How they work is interesting. We don't actually know, which is not hugely encouraging. I think we don't actually know one mechanism because they work in multiple areas. So they help by how fast you breathe, either fast or slow. They help with reducing oxygen use. They help with centrally altering your perception of breathlessness. And they may work directly on the load of blood reaching your heart by dilating some of the blood vessels, 
And in some cases, I'm sure it's because it has a little bit of sedation, which would remove the anxiety component somewhat. The way, you're, the way doctors will prescribe opiates will be starting slow, slow, and low. So each, each physician has comfort with different painkillers. There's no evidence that one works better than the other, but there are differences in the strengths of these painkillers. That's why different choices are made. We recommend starting a, the lowest possible dose of whichever painkiller is chosen and e increasing by aliquot to 25%. You will hear about what I'm calling benzos or tranquilizer type medications for anxiety. What we've learned from this is that these should not be the first line that is, are offered to you for shortness of breath, but certainly are helpful for anxiety, okay? If the goal is reduction of anxiety, and you'll be able to, if you have the illness, you'll be able to, to express that to your physician, then of course, these medications have been proven to be helpful. But if your anxiety is because you're breathless, then it may not be the right choice. Maybe treating the breathlessness with a painkiller may be a better choice, okay? So these are, again, meant to introduce the types of medications that you may hear of. And then, of course, there are what we're calling end-of-life treatment practices. And, and it's an interesting, interesting study of patients who have interstitial lung disease. As mentioned earlier, people with pulmonary fibrosis are less likely overall to have conversations relating to palliative care. And so an IPF database, a Finnish IPF database, actually looked at those patients, 257, and looked at their courses in hospital or their courses over time. What they found is that the majority of patients passed away in a hospital bed, um, either in a community or high treatment level center. One patient passed away in hospice and ate at home. The cause of death was mainly related to the pulmonary fibrosis and that the hospital admission um, during the last six months of life, between zero and six months, range that two months over six months. When they looked at whether or not they had the portion of advanced care planning that looks at resuscitation, they found that the majority of patients, and this is days before patients passed away, still 17 patients did not even have that. I don't know if it was discussed that that's one limitation, but we do know that in order not to kickstart their heart, even on the day of death, was not placed in their chart. That, that level, that amount of patients is most likely attributed to a lack of conversation, either months or years before they ended up in hospital, right? Or days before, like, because this next jump is at three days. The conversations are important. Not everybody would have chosen the same thing, and that's absolutely not what I would ever argue. But I do think that the conversation is important. Maybe that number wouldn't have been so high or traumatic. Looking at their symptom burden again, breathlessness was number one, but pain was number two. So definitely a symptom that obviously we cannot ignore, and that the medications that were present for them mainly were, in fact, the opiate medications. So overall, when we put this together, right, what we can take from that is 80% of patients met their end of life in a hospital. 80% of patients might have wanted to meet their end of life in a hospital, and that's okay too, but I doubt it. And so I guess, you know, what we can conclude from this is that thinking about things like where you would want to be, who would want to be around you towards the end of life are not discussed probably with the frequency they should be. The hospitalizations were the mean of one month duration in the last six months of life for 93% of patients, meaning if you view the opportunity to view the last six months of life, if you could go by retrospect or look at some of the indicators that we've reviewed here today, would you wanna spend a month of the last six in hospital? We can think about that though. 
and that aggressive lab and test done in the last 24 hours of life happened in more than half of those patients. And again, if 53% of those patients wanted to have those labs, we go with that. But I doubt it. And so maybe we can avoid big mood, traumatic bed changes, traumatic poking, blood tests, et cetera, that are unnecessary and may not be helpful if patients wouldn't want that. But the point is we need to ask. That leads us to the scope of care in hospice. So here, uh, so a hospice is where we would believe as a group, and with patient agreement, of course, that probably somebody is in their last three months of life, where they need access, access to nursing care and specialist physicians. Um, you could get admitted to a hospice at that point and have your symptom burden managed. Community su support, such as pharmacy, community mobile labs are available and dependent on. They don't have their own pharmacy on site. They don't do things like um, chest x-rays or CT scans routinely. However, if somebody had a pneumonia, of course, a chest x-ray and blood test would be helpful, especially if a person is able to take antibiotics and swallow them. There's also no IVs done there. And, that, and that's a, a philosophical care issue. If a person chooses to go to hospice and is comfortable with a natural end to their life, treating what's reversible while they're able, then hospice is the community care scope of care for you. There are all, all levels of comfort that needs to be employed, aggressive medications sometimes, or um, other Devices like suction, for instance, or oxygen, those, those needs will all be met in a hospice. So, you know, in summary, um, we recognize here and in palliative medicine that interstitial lung diseases, of which IPF and pulmonary fibrosis are the most studied, do carry a lot of symptom burden, even early on. That's validated and recognized, okay? It's there. And the, the largest complaint is recognizing when that is overlapping with a shortened time. Um, and sometimes that's an inject science, but we're working on it. But also you knowing some of the um, points that you could look at that say, hey, this, this may be associated with time being shorter are very important. We do know from our studies, some of which presented today, that palliative medicine approaches are not often used as much as they should be, but we're trying to change that, of course but that patients usually want them. Advanced care planning is very useful early for the many points that we talked about today, but also isn't done so well in interstitial lung disease. And a lot of that discomfort stems from the shoulder shrug of I don't know when, and the answer to that is early. If your doctor recommends that you should try painkillers, um, generally they are safe. They need to be monitored well, they need to be started low but they can be enormously helpful. Patients who have pulmonary fibrosis don't often feel that they have a choice of where they would choose to have the end of their life. And so maybe we should be discussing that more as a group and that there may be considerable suffering in the last six months to one year of life. And so employing the above approaches, approaches um, are enormously helpful, especially in retrospect. At the very least, we should be considering our home health referral and support system, and we should always, always, all healthcare professionals recognize who a substitute decision maker is. And as a patient with pulmonary fibrosis, you should also recognize who a substitute decision maker is that can adequately speak on your behalf regarding goals of care or early conversations you may have. Thank you so much for letting me speak, and I think yeah, Dr. Barwick and I would be happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Naya. Um, I have a couple of questions online at the moment. Um, someone wanted to know how do they access palliative care or hospice care? Is it a referral um, by a social worker, respirologist, a general practitioner? So that's a really good question. Um, is it okay if I enter that door? Are you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, generally, every healthcare authority or uh, province in Canada will be a little different. The systems, however, are incredibly similar in that anybody, anybody who's involved, any healthcare professional can make 
that referral. So usually, as you're mentioning, Sarah, it's, it's a paper referral, right, that can be accessed by the healthcare authority and unit for home care. And for instance, ours in BC will specify and say palliative care, um, do they have their advanced care planning done, et cetera, and you can actually specify that. The community team or the GP can make an offer to say, hey, I think my patient may require hospice and put in for a referral for that assessment. Same way, piece of paper, very easy. Okay, and is there a cost associated with this service? With the home care service, no, it's part of a benefits program here in British Columbia. I am assuming similar uh, in, in all other regions, uh, depending upon how you access it may be different, but again, it will be just a piece of paper that anyone can fill out everywhere. Um, so no, home care services, et cetera, do not cost. If there are certain copay costs associated with unique equipment, that may cost, but again, the government will subsidize that differently in every region, depending upon the criteria they have for coverage of that necessary piece of equipment. Hospice everywhere does cost, but is very heavily subsidized by the government as well. So for instance, in British Columbia, it's about $36 a day for like everything, like their meals, their nursing care, et cetera. Okay. The other thing I just wanted to mention, because it's been one of the points of advocacy nationally is a, a caregiver benefit. So that there's like a, a, you know, a coverage for someone who's providing care for someone in the last uh, weeks of life, particularly like about three months. And so they're trying to extend that to be a little bit of a longer period than just six weeks or so on. So, so it's something that, uh, you know, cer certainly um, a social worker, for instance, or someone on the palliative care team could tell you more about how to access that. But that's a federal benefit, so it's kind of like an unemployment benefit. If you if you if you qualify for unemployment benefits, then you would qualify for um, uh, for this compassionate care leave uh, to help provide care at end of life for someone. So that that's just another thing that may be available. Every province has slightly different things that they cover in terms of equipment and supplies and, and medications at end of life. Um, and so it's, it, you know, that's the kind of thing, that extra layer of support to make sure that you're talking to people who can make sure that you're accessing everything that, that you're eligible for. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hyer, someone wanted to ask, you um their spouse is currently being assessed for a lung transplant and so they're wondering even if their spouse is listed for a lung transplant should they be asking for palliative care 100 percent. that that is the answer and it isn't because you know that i don't think that their spouse will get a transplant i super duper hope they do it's a wonderful outcome, of course, you know, to have somebody who qualifies for transplant be transplanted. We hope for that for you. My lung doctor said absolutely knows that. However, uh, suffering in the meantime, if there is suffering, um, is unacceptable, right? In this day and age, in 2021, it's absolutely unacceptable. And so, yes, I say if the, the patient and spouse can wrap their mind around that, right? That sort of conjoined options if we look at it as the symptom management then absolutely yes okay um, one of the questions that we got received the pre submitted was that somebody wanted to know you know when you're when you receive this diagnosis is that when you should start thinking about how to plan to access palliative care or do you wait until you know you decide that you want to do it or you're your physician says, you know, it's time to consider it. You know, what what do you think the planning is? Uh, a lot of people want to know, like, you know, there's stages in cancer, are there stages in, in pulmonary fibrosis so that you'd be proactive and take care of it? Not that you might need it or not, but just to be, you know, planning ahead. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a really good question that I'll relate back to my slide about the organ trajectory. So there won't be a stage, I'll say that right off the bat, where we can say absolutely yes, now is the time for palliative medicine, okay? There may be a gradient though, right? Whereby breathlessness starts to interfere completely with quality of life. By that, I mean, you're not able 
to take a shower without getting through it, not able to brush your hair, your registered breathlessness scale is increasing, okay? And that is sometimes a very, very subjective feeling because we always in palliative medicine, when we talk about shortness of breath, we talk about how shortness of breath is what you say it is, not what I say it is, right? So I, I so as a doctor, we can't tell you this is a time for palliative care. We can tell you when we have worries that your home supports may be needing to be increased, that we are watching you struggle, yes. But you, you know, the next show answer to what, what the question is overall, which is, do I start thinking about it now? The answer is absolutely yes. Not thinking about end of life care planning or end of life care, but thinking about goals of care, right? What do you expect and want? Who is your substitute decision maker, right? How do you view a good life? What are short term goals that you would like to identify? And having an open conversation about those things with your physician are absolutely things you should be thinking of and recognizing. You know, in some in some cases, the default substitute decision maker is your next of kin, the closest person to you. But exercising any documents that you want to get in order for the unexpected, it's just another reminder for all of us that we should really be doing those things. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to let the audience know that you can type your questions into our Q and A, and I'd be happy to read them for um, both Dr. Barwick and Meyer. Uh, the other question I have that was pre-submitted was that someone wanted to know um, how can they access palliative care for themselves as a caregiver? You know, oftentimes um, caregivers are overwhelmed and they need, to, you know, even just to go grocery shopping, go get a simple haircut, simple things to take care of themselves. How can they access that as well besides the patient? So maybe I'll start with that and then Dr. Nair can uh, tune in. So in most provinces, there are uh, caregiver networks of support so that there's a family caregiver network in, in British Columbia that has supports. The other online resource that's really valuable and um, is the Canadian Virtual Hospice. So that's uh, an online support that has um, lots and lots of information about resources in different communities. And they also have um, ask a professional tab so that if you have a specific question and you're kind of struggling with how to get it, their group of professionals, be it a social worker or a physician or a nurse or a respiratory therapist can, can start to kind of maybe hone in for you a little bit about how do I do that in my community. Um, and, uh, and then Canadian uh, Hospice Palliative Care Association has a whole section for caregivers um, because we do know that, that the, the challenges are real. And um, just because I guess in most provinces, they're they, there's usually a limited pot of resources. And so they're trying to make sure that that pot gets to the people who need it most. So uh, like we've talked about the pipe the care benefits plan, you know, that is really for people in the last weeks to months of life. It's not for years. And so then you may struggle and people will have had this experience of, of being referred to palliative care and someone saying it's too early or whatever. Um, and so then you're kind of caught in this, well, I need more than I'm getting, but I don't know how to get it. So uh, Canadian Virtual Hospice can be a good resource. And because they have professionals online who can then like I've been contacted by them to say, we have a person in your area who's really looking to get connected and can you, can you help facilitate that? So, so we, this, this network of extra layer of support I've talked about, we really are trying to make that as, as fulsome of, as possible, whether you live in Toronto or Vancouver or in some remote community where those services just may, may not be at hand. So hopefully, um, uh, that will give you a place to start and then potentially connections to people who can connect you further for what's more uh, available in your province. Thank you, Dr. Barwick. Dr. Nair? I agree with everything Dr. Barwick said. I don't think there's a single additive to that. Um, thank you, Dorothy. Okay. Um, so I guess Dr. Nair, Someone wanted to ask, how do you bring up this topic with your, you know, GP or your primary health care provider or with your respirologist? 
Um, not every respirologist um, has that as part of their practice, as it, as it seems like you have with your practice. So how, how do you bring that subject up? Thank you for asking that question, which is great. Um, yeah, you know, I would say when I first started 10 years ago, I, I don't know anybody that used to do that. But now, actually, you know, all respirologists are really, really all trying our best to understand that people are living longer with the disease modifying therapies that we have available. And so are learning a lot more about disease trajectory and listening very, very well. Um, so practical tips for bringing things up with your doctor are simply to be very honest, like very honest and clear and say, maybe as an example, um, you've told me that I have an illness that won't get better. How will it get worse? So asking an open-ended question, those are always the best questions, but, you know, and asking like, will you, right, you, whether you're GP or respirologist, tell me, or do you need me to ask you again, right, about how I'm doing with my overall organ trajectory? You know, I love when patients ask that question, you know, because then, you know, really, I will draw out the organ trajectory and I can say where I think they are on it, honestly. And they know that it's the best that I can do, right? There are no, you'll see some calculators for diseases like COPD for an amount of time left. We don't have such a calculator for pulmonary fibrosis, but we'll do our best. If your respirologist feels uncomfortable, because I'm assuming that would be the first person that you sort of ask that to, then I think it's entirely fair to say, you know, like, okay, I didn't get the answer that I wanted or my lung doctor, maybe they just aren't, right, as comfortable. It is perfectly practical to make an appointment with your GP for a discussion regarding um, advanced care planning as well. Okay, uh, so I wanted to know, so, uh, Dr. Barwich, you're known as a palliative care physician. Is, is that just unique to BC or can you find somebody like you anywhere across Canada that really sort of uh, their practice is about palliative care? Yeah, so both Dr. Nair and I are palliative care uh, physicians. So these are either family physicians who've taken an extra year of training in palliative care or they're actually specialists like Dr. Nair in, in um, lung diseases, a respirologist. And she's also taken additional training, which is one or two years in Canada to be a palliative medicine specialist. So palliative medicine is now recognized as a specialty by the Royal College. Um, so th that group of elite physicians who have that um, Royal College designation are fairly rare. But every province has um, fairly extensive networks that cover most areas and geographies and regions of a palliative medicine specialty team. Um, and whether that access is to a physician uh, like myself who specialized in palliative care uh, by phone or in person depends a little bit on your geography. If you're in a really a large, fairly remote or rural area, that person may only be someone on the phone or now with virtual, like you can do an appointment online and, and have these appointments or in every area. As far as I know, there are very few areas in Canada where there isn't a palliative care team and always access to a physician in most provinces, 24 seven supports for patients and families um, and uh, 24 seven access to a, a physician or a nurse that can help provide answers in the midst of crisis. So uh, it is worth going online and just finding out for your province, what does that network look like? And as I said, we're trying as much as we can to educate paramedics, family doctors, hospitalists, emergency room physicians, others that may be your first point of contact with the health system. So they kind of can provide basic palliative care and know how to refer you on to more specialized supports as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, someone online also wanted to know, because palliative care and hospice care can be such an emotional, heavy topic, are there supportive uh, services available to make it easier to discuss this with our family and caregivers? You know, how can we broach that, that topic without, um, you know, becoming too emotional and, and difficult to talk about? 
So that, that's the kind of, um, the umbrella for that is known as advanced care planning. So it really is about supporting people with conversations. And Dr. Nyers referred to that several times through her discussion about the importance of conversations at every stage of illness. Number one, to understand where you're at, to understand the choices that you're facing, and then to be supported to make the right decision for you. And then to help your family understand the decision that you've made so that they can speak for you if you're too short of breath or too distressed to speak for yourself so that everyone's kind of on the same page. And as much as possible, that should happen before a crisis rather than in the midst of crisis when most people, you know, just kind of want everything to be done. But um, we need these clear conversations that are really based on good informed consent towards a plan of treatment that may be aggressive or not so aggressive or someone somewhere in between. Um, so advanced care planning resources speak up is the national advanced care planning organization and again within their website and I can I've put the link to virtual hospice on the, in the chat I can put the link to the advanced care planning resources in the chat. Um, every, they'll, they'll link you uh, to workbooks and tools that have been developed in every single province uh, that are specific to the laws of that province guarding how do I apply um, how do I legally appoint someone who can speak for me? Because sometimes the rest, the right person may not be your 80 year old partner. It may be your daughter who's a nurse or your son who, who um, you know, is a paramedic and has, is more conversant and uh, able to deal with medical issues in a crisis. So you can, you sometimes have to appoint that person as your proxy in some provinces or as your representative in British Columbia or as your substitute decision maker or healthcare proxy or uh, power of attorney. It's called different things, but there's always a way to formally say, this is is what I want and this is who will speak to me for me to say to other people what I want if I can't speak for that myself it's not what the family wants when you can't speak it's what what have you discussed with them ideally and that you can then say we talked about this with my dad this is what he was really clear uh, about in terms of his own wishes and that's someone who can advocate for that because sometimes as Dr. Nair mentioned, healthcare professionals aren't quite as up to speed as they need to be. And sometimes you really need someone who can be very clear about, we've had these discussions, here's what we decided, and here's what my dad would want, and how do we make that happen? That goals of care, uh, and that's what palliative care is all about, is what are your goals and how do we align our care to the best of our ability with, with your goals at this stage of your illness or at that stage, um, as if we've talked in terms of future planning. So that's kind of the goal and the advanced care planning resources, I can post them in the chat. Thank you very much. Now, both of you had mentioned the end of life, um, you know, portion of the palliative care. Um, someone wanted to know, what about MAID, the medical assistance of dying? You know, um, rather than waiting at the very end to say this is what you want your end of life care to be, um, could, could both of you speak to uh, the medical assistance in dying? Um, what's the difference? Um, what are some of the, the rules and regulations that you might be able to share that are common or maybe different? I can start. So Goals of care are personal, they're individualized. And, um, and we know that everyone has a different threshold for what they want and when they may want their goals of care to change. Some people uh, may say, well, when I get to this stage of my illness or that stage of my illness, uh, medical assistance in dying is something I may want. Um, what we sometimes find, and I've seen this a lot in my practice, both Dr. Nair and I work at a cancer agency uh, to provide uh, pain and symptom supports to people, is that those goals may change because what you anticipate may be the point at which you'd want something more aggressive. Uh, when you get there, it's not so bad and you're still enjoying your life and you have the supports you need to live as well as you can. And you decide you wanna live longer because um, again, shortness of breath is very distressing and people get quite anxious. And then they often imagine that, you know, like when I get to this level, then I might want to not suffer. And I may want to have something that's quick, that's planned, that's organized. Um, but again, we just encourage uh, those discussions. Every province, again, has access to uh, medical assistance in dying uh, 
coordination and, and pre people who provide that, that is not part of palliative care. That is a completely separate thing. So uh, the opioids um, that Dr. Nyers mentioned or the benzodiazepines, those would never be used by a palliative care provider with the goal of ending your life. Uh, palliative care neither prolongs nor extends your life. It says dying is part of life, we accept it, but we also will have help you live as well as you can for as long as you can. And if you make a choice to have medical assistance in dying, that would mean a referral to a different group of providers who would go through their assessment and uh, um, process. There's two providers, uh, depending on where you are in your illness, um, that, um, that would also determine whether you'd be eligible or not, and they would be able to help you with that, uh, with that process, which is different than and separate from palliative care. Uh, okay. Dr. Nair, anything else you want to say about that? Yeah, I'll just add, so I agree with everything Dr. Barros has said, obviously. Um, and, that, and I'll just reiterate that I, I did mention, you know, when you have very severe symptoms, you could be admitted to a palliative care unit, we could use, use heavy duty medications. Yes, of course, these concepts are large and confusing. I want to focus on the fact that the intent of those things are different, okay? The intent of medical aid in dying is to end somebody's life as their philosophical wish. And so that would be very, very clear and, and done through a separate process. The intention on any palliative care unit without the discussion um, of medical aid and dying is not to end your life, but allow your body to go on its own natural journey towards the end of life. And that we have a lot of evidence that supports that it does not actually hasten death to do that. Okay. Um, to avoid that confusion, you will find that a lot of palliative care doctors um, don't actually provide medical aid and dying. I am one of them, right? For example. And that is for the exact question that was asked about the difference. You don't want there to be any confusion on a person's behalf when you're talking about using these medications so that a person can be sure that when I prescribe the medications, that isn't my intention. So, um, so just, just make sure that if you're wondering about medical aid and dying, that you know that it's just a whole separate process, an easy one. It's not meant there to confuse or, or be hard just to, to recognize that the intention is different. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other question from our audience today? As uh, you have the opportunity to ask such two outstanding experts in their field and also from the uh, province of British Columbia. So if you have anything in particular that's to that province, I think you've got two great resources that will be able to answer you that way. All right. Well, it, it looks like um, we don't have any more. So I want to thank both of you for joining us today and giving such an informative uh, presentation. Thank you for clarifying all the points that we've had. Um, as I said, it's it's been really um, eye opening and learning about palliative care. I think that there's a lot of misnomers out there and misunderstanding what palliative care is. And I think that your session today has really clarified and crystallized it, at least for me anyways. Thank you so much for having me. An Thanks. honor, yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you both. Take care. Bye.